Hello, and welcome to Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this program, which is designed to give all of us a little more insight into what goes on around our capital and the personalities, the individuals who are involved in government issues and community issues. We have as our guest today two folks who are involved in issues relating to the developmentally disabled. One person is developmentally disabled, and the other person is the executive director of an organization that provides assistance and resources and works with the developmentally disabled. I'd like to welcome David Beam, first Thank of all. Thank you, Kevin. And also Jan Kral, executive director of Shangri-La. Hi, Kevin. Now, we've talked a bit before we uh, went on the air, so to speak, and, but I, I really want to get a little bit of more background information about each of you. and. And, and how you've come to get involved in these issues. And I'll first ask you, David, you are developmentally disabled. Right. But you've established yourself as an advocate for advocate the Advocate for disabled. disability people in the community. And why have you done that? Since I come out of, out of Fairview, I decided to go in and would have been in politics for disability people, what services don't need, what services don't, don't have. Okay, well, we're going to talk then about those issues. I'd like to know a little bit more about David Beam, the person. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your, your family? Um, I was in Ferry. I was six years old. Uh, I was come out of there. I was 18. I went in Job Corps. And I, when I got out of Job Corps, I uh, come, come back here and I started going to politics for disability people and help the families. And aren't you married now? Yes, I am married. Can you tell us about your wife? Five years. I, my wife is named Rachel. She works, Capital Journal, putting stuff in the, the trucks. And I do volunteer work for the city of Salem. Well, uh, I understand you also do, you work at some other paying jobs that you're, yeah. uh, you're not relying on social security disability or something no. like that. Tell us about some of the pain I do, jobs. Sometimes I do yard work and sometimes I help my brother put out flyers for his company. Uh, I do just do volunteer work for the Salem police. I do stuff for housing. I'm doing stuff for the mayor of Salem. I just do volunteer work. And from my working with you, and you've come to me many times to talk to me about disability issues and, and developmentally disabled people, right. um, you, you seem to be a unique person in the sense that you are developmentally disabled, but you see yourself as an advocate. That is, you're not just an outsider coming in to help out, but you're an insider. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, since I was a little kid, outsider, this helped the, the ones that need help. The ones don't need you know any services don't have to learn or on their own. That's how I feel. I did it, and so that's how I feel that I can try to help some. Well, your sense of volunteerism would be nice if everybody would would, would copy that and, and follow that. But Jen, mm -hmm. you are not just a professional who works as executive director. You're known for your going the many extra miles as a volunteer. But tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what your background is. Well, I've been in the disability field for about 20 years now. I've worked in group homes and, and in various organizations. And now uh, with Shangri-La, uh, we provide a lot of services, uh, housing and employment and supports for people with, with disabilities. But we also are really working to become an integral part of our community. And we're wanting to build connections with our community so that we can see a, a larger world with uh, lots of diversity and lots of different qualities that people bring to the life of our community. Uh, people like David, uh, having a chance to work with him helps people like me understand the way that we, we need to think. Uh, rather than doing for, we need to be doing with people. Well, and if, in fact, David, I would think you are a success story in terms of someone who's out there working with the community, mm -hmm. active in the community. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? Well, I really don't want um, credit for it. I just want more involvement with disability people in the, in the community and the state because some of them don't have any experience with these people and a lot of them put them down in the community. There, do you think that, is it sort of ignorance on the part of the rest of the community that you don't know about or understand? The just don't understand them in the community. Now, I've been referring to the developmentally disabled. There are other kinds of disabilities. Jan, do you want to talk a little bit about how this all connects up? 
Sure. Um, there are people who have developmental disabilities that have certain kinds of supports and certain kinds of gifts that they bring. Um, but most of all, they're people. People first, we like to say, right. aren't we, David? Um, but other people in our community may be experienced traumatic brain injury, um, mental illness, physical limitations, alcohol and drug abuse, and, and uh, problems relating to that are all part of, of our culture here. And we all need to be understanding how we can integrate people into our society society so that everyone has a good chance for a decent life. Do we have a problem with labeling sometimes instead of just relating to individuals and their Absolutely. strengths and weaknesses? Absolutely. It's something we're really working hard in our organization to talk about employment and housing and supports for all people because all of us need employment and housing and supports. We don't need to talk about the things that might be different or wrong as much as what we have in common. Um, and we do label people. And once people label, David, I'm sure, has had that experience. Yeah. When people label you, then they think you don't know uh, what you need. And, and who knows better than the person themselves what's needed. David, would, would it be your thinking, and I think it is because we've talked about this before, that uh, people ought to approach somebody who has some apparent disability and remember that that person also has capabilities. Mm -hmm. Besides Absolutely. being a human being, has some capabilities, and they ought to look for the capabilities to right. work with that person. Mm -hmm. Have you run into situations where people have not been willing to pay attention to you and, and give you the time to, to understand? Well, oh, my mom, she, uh, since I was a little kid, she understand my problems. Um, some, some families don't understand them in the, in the public. Like some bus drivers don't understand these people. Um, where, where the right, right to rights are, what's for employment, where their addresses are, you know, because I'm, I'm stutter. A little bit, I'm scared. Well, so part of the notion then would be that uh, folks in society generally ought to, just as if you see someone who doesn't speak English, they speak Russian, and you yeah. may want to help them interpret and understand. Mm -hmm. If someone has a speech impediment or some other difficulty communicating, they ought to be more understanding about right. helping out. Mm -hmm. Is Are there ways that the community is changing in this? Have you seen some changes over the last few years, David? I think there are really ch a challenge out there, and I think each time we go to the legislature, more people will be more be involved. The issues, the disability issues, what's the state's needs for these people? What are you going to do for like homeless people or disability people or homeless, or you can't get on housing? They need to have a system there for these people to understand these issues. And as we've worked with those issues, Jan, have you seen any changes over the years, in the recent years? I've seen um, lots of improvement, lots of, of increased understanding and, and more resources made available to people. Um, on the other hand, I've seen uh, as more and more people are identified as having special needs, um, a lot of, of the people maybe in our community and across our country are questioning just how those people need to receive supports and whether they should receive supports. And I, I think sometimes our society almost gets frightened by the size of the need. And so um, I have seen also a pulling back certainly uh, uh, of availability of resources, but also sometimes in terms of welcoming of people with differences into, into our culture. Now, in fact, as you touch on that, that brings us in tune a little bit with even federal issues such as Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about what's happening in Congress and what the concerns are? What is it we say? The situation is fluid now? Is that the way we're talking about it? Um, what, what we're facing right now for people with disabilities uh, and our elderly with the Medicaid cuts is a lot of uncertainty about how uh, services might be delivered. I have to admit that part of me is optimistic because I do see some deregulation potential and uh, the, the opportunity maybe to direct dollars where they go without so much rules. And I think last time I was here we were talking about too many rules, as a matter of fact. Uh, so in some respects that's really exciting. Um, a lot of what is concerning, of course, is exactly where they're going to draw the line with what base year they're going to use for Oregon in particular uh, and how that relates to the Oregon health care plan, which also is very important to people with disabilities. And tell, tell me how that's important, to, and Jan and, then me, and David, I'll let you pick up on that too. Why is the Oregon health plan important? 
it provides health care for people with disabilities um, and, and also enables them to get b various medical services that um, they wouldn't necessarily be able to have without some kind of support. Um, the other thing that's nice about the health care plan, although in Marion County it's not quite as true as it is throughout the state, is that people are able to have more choice in their physicians sometimes with that. Well, once you have the Oregon health plan, would it be fair to say that a person with a disability then probably has better opportunities in the job market because they don't have to worry so much about finding a job that does have health coverage. That's a really good point, Kevin. I hadn't really thought of it that way, yes. Well, David, how about you in terms of your, your working in, in the community, your volunteer work as well as your paid work? Um, is health care an issue, a concern for you if, if that's not available? Well, I've been writing to Mrs. Clinton, Mr. Clinton on health care issues about disability people. Um, I think the president needs to appoint a disability, disability person on his staff on health care. Uh, and I think the governor needs to appoint a disability person. Then they'll understand what's out there for the doctors for these people. And in the counties too. And there's like, like the only employment, don't want to get hurt on a job, then we'll got issue what, how much cost is going to cost you? And the dollars rise. You don't got the money, health care should, employers could pay for it. Well, let me ask you something about employment then, because you brought that up. And, and yes, Medicare and Medicaid reforms, we're going to have to keep an eye on that to make sure, that at least try to make noise so that Congress will be sensitive to how the states will react. And I would hope Oregon, if, if, if given the money uh, at a decent level, we, we could be more creative than the feds have ever been. But <laughs> I think so too. Um, as far as the job market goes, and this is something I don't know about, I mean, I'm familiar with special workshops and programs where people with disabilities can be employed at a lower rate or a piecework rate because uh, they may not be able to compete, some of them, mm -hmm. some of them are very, very, very competitive, mm -hmm. uh, may not be able to compete generally uh, with other skilled workers. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the minimum wage laws? Are those, is there an exemption for those kinds of operations? Or what do we do to try to make sure that we keep the, the employment laws in tune to make sure employment's available for people with disabilities? There, there are exemptions. Um, it's called a sheltered workshop certificate. Um, unfortunately, that presents a concept that may or may not be true because we can, uh, under certain circumstances, help any employer uh, get an exemption so that they can employ a person with disabilities who maybe can only do a portion of the job or is especially good at one part of the job but maybe not at the other part. Um, so that's true within our community jobs as well, but also within our organization we operate several businesses, a restaurant, a, a Cherry City wood shop, a grounds maintenance business, packaging, a variety of different things that we do. And in those cases, uh, we have a, a certificate that allows us to pay less than minimum wage to people. Uh, we need to do time studies and be very careful about exactly what people are producing, and people need to be uh, regularly reviewed. Now, you've just brought up that. a point that I think is important for the business community to hear, and that is sometimes I hear from business people saying, well, this is unfair. They're competing with us, and they're not paying minimum yeah. wage. And the answer is, well, wait a minute. You can hire these folks, too. Mm -hmm. You can get a certificate, mm -hmm. and if you're willing to provide the jobs and the training, you can pay less than minimum wage if you document it and, and you show that this is an appropriate situation. Mm -hmm. That's available to any business, isn't it? That's right. If we help them do that, it's especially available to them. Um, the other thing about whether or not it's competitive or not uh, is um, it does cost some extra money to accommodate for people with disabilities in a job. And that's, that's what we use the dollars that we get is to provide uh, extra training, extra support to help people be successful. We don't use those dollars to offset our business costs. And in fact, you are a nonprofit. That's right, and we definitely are that. <laughs> now, David, how do you feel about the job market? Uh, do you think that uh, there are improving opportunities now for people with disabilities? Well, I think, <clears throat> just how I feel, I think we should raise uh, middle wage for disability people in the, com in the community the whole state because a lot of disability people can't already really get by right now like food rent um just go out to want to go spending money want to take a trip or see the families mm -hmm. or put it away for like you want to retire some of them don't have much money to live on all right well with that point which is that we should be challenged to make sure we're, we are paying appropriately for right. those kinds mm -hmm. of services. I will turn to our audience and mention that you're with us on Capital Insight. 
I'm your host, State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem. Our guests today are David Beam from Salem and Jan Kral from Salem. Jan is the Executive Director of Shangri-La. David is an advocate for the developmentally disabled and disabled people generally. If you ever have any questions or concerns or just want to send along some comments, you can always contact me at Capital Insight, H395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. We're always happy to hear from you. And turning back to our guests, um, we were just talking about the minimum wage issue and, and, and how that might be addressed. Congress is looking at that issue. My guess is they're not going to do anything about it. Then the issue has been raised in the Oregon context. Oregon does have a higher minimum wage by state law than the federal minimum wage. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I'm assuming that that's going to become a, a stronger issue next session of the legislature. Since the Oregon economy is doing well, the question is what floor you set for wages. But, uh, David, you mentioned trying to raise the, the wages that are paid to folks with disabilities. Um, the one question I have is, do you, do you agree with the notion that if someone can't produce quite as much that they can be paid less and, and then be provided with assistance? Well, yeah, and, and, and in a way, I think the ones doing a good, really good job in the community should get something, and the ones can't make it, should get something too. Make it e even, straight well, across the board. Well, at some point, the community needs to provide support. Something there for these people. And you, you, can't, you can't turn these de people down, because a lot of them are good people out there. Well, that part of our sense of community, if we truly want to call ourselves civilized, is to lend a helping hand to anybody. Yeah. But then uh, I would think that we would also want to challenge folks to say, and if you can do contribute some, you should receive a even more than that floor. Even more that is, credit mm -hmm. there for these people. Mm -hmm. Let me shift gears a little bit and ask you about the political process and lobbying. You mentioned you're on a, a, a group that the mayor has appointed. Yeah, on ADA. And that's the Americans with Disabilities yeah. Act. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about participating in, in a group like well, that? Well, I wanted it so long time ago, and now I'm doing it. And, and the, the thing is, I think the city of Salem should give disability persons more, a little bit more credit. Hire these people for the city jobs or state jobs, because a lot of them can do it in the community. Well, there's a, there's a point there that in terms of the political process now, you're, you can be an advocate with the mayor. How is it like when you're trying to lobby the legislature? Because I've seen you around those halls often. Well, now. I talk to these senators. I meet with agencies. I get along with everybody this this fine. The thing is, <clears throat> some programs will never been some have been cut. I know that, and at least I'm still trying to keep everything there for these people. Do you ever realize that you know if you weren't there, uh, sometimes things are better because you're there, and sometimes things aren't don't get as bad as they might be because right. you're there. You're sort of like the fireman keeping the fire down or yeah. keep putting it out. Well, Jan, how about you? Do you ever, I mean, you come around occasionally to provide information, but mm -hmm. do, do you ever consider yourself as a something of a you know, citizen lobbyist besides being an activist? Well, in one session I did have to register. <laughs> I did have to do as that. As a lobbyist. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, I, I do consider myself a citizen lobbyist, and I think it's part of how I can contribute to our community to help inform people. And I think sometimes it helps to support our legislators when they have difficult decisions to make, to know that um, following conscience is, is important, even though sometimes it may not be popularly supported. And I, I think sometimes people like me can help make that easier. Now, I know both of you try to be a basically nonpartisan about all of this, and that's important too, mm -hmm. especially from a nonprofit's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not going to ask you to label anybody, but do you run into situations where you find that some of our elected officials are f afraid to listen or don't want to listen? And I'm just asking an open-ended question. I'm, I know you run into situations where you find people who are receptive. What kind of reception do you get, generally? And I'll ask you first, David. Uh, well, I put down a couple of times, and I'm still, still hitting these people, let them know how the disability person can do it in the community. But you're persistent, aren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never give up. And uh, so there are some folks who don't want to hear the message, yeah. don't want to deal with you. How about you, Jan? I haven't had that experience uh, for a long time. 
but with term limits, I'm a little bit worried about it. One of the things that I've noticed is our experienced legislators uh, understand the issue and have spent a lot of time learning to understand uh, the whole scope of the problem and how it relates to funding and the quality of life in our community. Uh, people who don't understand the issue are usually our new legislators uh, who are concerned about the cost and who uh, want to see equity and fairness for everyone in the state. And so sometimes they're a little less open and a uh, little less able to understand the depth of the issue. You just made me think about something, a little mm -hmm. side comment about term limits. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I always love to ask the business community, how would you like to know that every time you hire an employee, uh, after you've trained them, say, that uh, you automatically must mm -hmm. fire them? say mm -hmm. after six years for the mm -hmm. House of Representatives mm -hmm. or after eight years for the Senate, which is mm -hmm. what we'll now have with term limits in Oregon. Right. Um, and so we're telling the electorate, you must fire your representative or you must fire your senator. You cannot keep that person on the job even though you may have, they may have learned a lot mm -hmm. and someone new has to step in. Um, I have, so there's some tension there between the idea of, well, citizen involvement and then we're, we're going to pull back and say, no, automatically. Be, it was mainly a congressional issue, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, people were fed up with Congress it long term. It doesn't affect congressional, does it? Now it doesn't, because that was found unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So we amended the Oregon Constitution to set in term limits, and now it only applies to the Oregon legislature, mm -hmm. where term limits have never been a problem, mm -hmm. where every session you see about a 20% turnover mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's still, the impact hasn't hit yet, because those of us who were around when it passed, uh, it's being grandfathered. We're grandfathered for our prior service. But mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, I'm only allowed to run one more time for the House of Representatives. I can run next year, and after serving that two-year term, I'm out constitutionally. Mm -hmm. Cannot return. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we'll see how it, what happens. I'm getting off on the side, though, because you brought up a point mm -hmm. that I'm in my fourth term now, and I've learned so much working with mm -hmm. folks such as David and Jan, both of you. Mm -hmm. And you don't learn that overnight. No. And the, and the other part of that that's very concerning to me is that um, I've always found the Oregon legislature really responsive to citizens. And that balance is maintained by the legislature because they understand the state system, I think. Uh, if we have people who don't understand the state system, our state employees then become the driving force of, of how we operate our government. And while I see those as talented, competent people, I think the balance of the legislature and the state employees is very important. So I hope maybe we can do something about that in the future. Well, one solution which I've proposed is there's mm -hmm. an overall, the, this, the Constitutional Amendment says 12 years total, but six years House, eight years Senate. And I mm -hmm. say, why don't you just say 12 years total, and it doesn't matter where you serve, so you mm -hmm. can have some people who've been 12 years mm -hmm. in the House or 12 mm -hmm. years in the Senate mm -hmm. and get some experience on the job. Well, we'll see whether or not the legislature will address it next mm -hmm. time. They, they wouldn't pass it out this no, last time. I'm yeah, I can see why they wouldn't this but, time. But returning to the immediate issues mm -hmm. in terms of uh, people with disabilities, David, um, what, are the, what are the things that you're most active with right now in the community? Well, make sure uh, all the disability people have got rights. Okay. And in that, didn't you just get an award? Yeah, national, state from a state award for disability award. Now, I'm going to ask you to blow your horn a little bit here, toot your own horn. Tell, tell us about the award. Didn't you get a call from the uh, yeah, vice president's the vice office? president staff. Uh, well, thank you for, uh, I got a national award. And um, have you received the certificate yet? or I got an award this second, this year, and uh, under the, uh, the, uh, the governor and secretary of state and Al Gore staff. Well, congratulations. Thank you. I'm sure you must feel at least there's some recognition for all the work that you've put. Yeah. Well, Jan, how long have you been executive director now at shangri -La? Oh, almost nine years. It's been a while. And there's been a lot of changes at shangri -La in those Yes, there have been a lot of changes. You want to give us a little capsule commentary on how things have changed? Well, sure. shangri -La used to be pretty much an institution that was located out in, uh, out in the country. Uh, now we have over 60 locations around town. Um, 18 or, or 20 homes where people with disabilities live in small groups uh, next to other people in their neighborhoods. We also have people living in apartments throughout. We have about um, seven businesses that we operate. 
uh, where we, people with disabilities are employed. Uh, we now serve people with a variety of disabilities, uh, traumatic brain injury, alcohol and drug issues, um, people who have mental illness. Uh, we work very hard to help those people get jobs in the community, competitive jobs, uh, where they do look for benefits and, and various kinds of um, um, quality of life in their workplace. We have just about 200 employees, and we serve just about 250 people with disabilities every day in, in our organization. So we've, we've come a long ways, a long ways. We have a wonderful board of directors, a very talented and, and good staff. Um, our biggest problem right now is struggling with the good economy because that makes it harder to hire. People are more fluid in the job market and so um, in our direct care area we're really needing some more direct care staff. Now, would that, because things are fairly flush, wouldn't you expect or hope that the state would step in and help a bit during those hard times of transition? <laughs> oh, Kevin, have you ever heard me say anything like that before? Yes, of course I would like that. Um, but I think, um, and, and maybe the state will be able to with, with block granting and if we're able to get a decent share for Oregon. Um, maybe we will be able to do things differently so that we can pay better wages. Um, it's, it's really a, a sad situation when you have people that are very dependent on support and that the staff who care about them can't afford to continue to work with them. And what you're getting at is that the amount of money that you have available to pay the right. staff is limited mm -hmm. and we have not increased the assistance for that from the state. That's right. And because the economy is doing well, other employers are paying more for that kind of That's help right. and you're not competitive and you're having a hard time attracting right. and maintaining that staff. That we're not competitive, exactly. And we ask a lot. You know, we ask for soul as well as uh, It's not talent. just a job. Yeah, it's not. It's a, it's a, well, I'm trying to think of another term. It's almost an avocation. A lot of people see it that way. They have to. People who work uh, for very low wages for years and years. Um, and, and that's because they have friends like David and, and other people that they really value giving that support to. But it's hard for them to live. Well, David, as far as that goes, um, are, you, are you seeing that with the job market the way it is now, that uh, it is getting harder to, to, to get, get organizations to, to have the staff that they need to help people with disabilities? Yeah, that some of them come in in Oregon <clears throat> are trying to get a job. Some of the disability people come to Oregon and back east in different states, come here in Oregon. Some just try to make it in the community. And some of them try to make it better for themselves for to get a job and make the families understand this problem. Because a lot of... Uh, families is can't really, somehow can't make it. Well, let me bring this back to another issue. We only have a couple of minutes left and you know I'm known as an advocate anti-crime and all that. That's that's fine, but I also talk about the long range and if we understood the long range, some of the folks who have disabilities, uh, mental illness, um, folks uh, who uh, uh, may have drug or alcohol problems that also slides off into the fringe issue of crime. Not so much developmental disabilities, I recognize that. And some folks need to understand that you're actually helping reduce crime too, or the potential for people mm -hmm. to enter into crime. Someone who's mentally ill, who uh, may need some help and mm -hmm. some medication so that exactly. they, they can hang in there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and better yet, people with drug and alcohol addictions mm -hmm. who, when, when they're under the influence, will end up getting into criminal That's activity. Right. So maybe we ought to remember to try to pull those things together. Well, for the next session, what's the, is the big thing going to be the block grants and how we deal with it in the legislature? That's one of the big things, obviously. Um, but within that, I hope that we look at a different way of delivering services altogether. Uh, some people are talking, at, looking at it more like managed health care kinds of services. Um, but one of the pressing issues for our organization is that people with severe disabilities are aging. And uh, because of the way the funding works, they're not going to be allowed to age in their homes. And that's a very expensive place to go to a nursing home. And it's a very sad place to have to leave your home because things don't work to support you there. Right now we have a man that we're supporting uh, to die in, in one of our homes. And uh, we're learning that, that we really have to face that issue. Well, then one of the things we'll need, we'll need to do then is to remember to use common sense and be less rigid about how we apply these programs. Yes. Okay. That's right. On that note, I'll thank you both for thank joining you. us on Capital Insights. Thank you, Thank Kevin. you, Jan and David. Thank you, Kevin. And thanks to our audience. We'll see you again next time. Thank you.